Today starts the very beginning of what we call our stewardship season at First Church, a time when we begin to think about how we might pledge to the budget. It's one of those maybe awkward moments in churches when we talk about money, something we don't do so well. But I think churches ought to talk about money, about giving, about pledging, because when we do so, we really and truly, I believe, are talking about what is priority, about what God has given to us, about what God has called us to do, and how we can make a difference in the world. So if you're with us for the first time or second time, and you've been looking for a place to call home because you're so frustrated because they talk about money, we're talking about money. <laughs> for the next three weeks, specifically, but we're talking about thanks and giving, about God's generosity and about how we are part of that wonderful opportunity. I'm not here to be the one that says if you give, God will make your life greater. If you pray for something, that you'll get it. That if you honor what the pastor says, I'll show up in a very nice suit, a Rolex watch, and a $10 million mansion while there's poverty existing in the world. But I will tell you this. God has done some wonderful transformation in our lives and continues to do so not because of money, but because of our generous hearts as we've responded to how God is generous to us. Let us pray. God, may the words of my mouth, a meditation of our hearts, be acceptable to you. You're our strength. You provide us with comfort. Amen. Danny Thomas was a comedian. He was an actor on television. And he used to say that there are two kinds of people in this world. There are takers and there's givers. He said, one, the takers often eat better. But he said it's the givers that always sleep better. You know, the Bible reminds us that the Lord loves a cheerful giver. There's that fine print at the bottom that we often miss reading, though, that the Lord also loves a grumpy giver, too. I'm not talking about anybody, am I? But perhaps the question for us should be, as we ask, is why? Why do we give? Why give in the first place? over the next few weeks here that's what we want to do we want to reflect on why we give what's the importance about giving as an expression of our faith and who benefits from our giving what does giving do and how does that affect my faith as a follower especially our financial giving you know each week we also want to address some principles that can help you in your financial life too now, will this make you filthy rich? Probably not. But it could help you sleep just a little bit better each night. And wouldn't that be a nice place to start? You see, we've talked about some pretty serious subjects here at First Church. We've talked about, you know, things like giving and money. But we've also talked about other pretty significant topics, too, within our church. We've talked about gun violence. We've learned how to be in conversation with other people of different faiths. We've talked about those topics that make us maybe a little uncomfortable when it comes to social issues within our community and around the world. So why can't we talk about money? Let's talk about money. Here's some facts. The Bible consists of some 2,300 passages or verses about money, and give or take, depending on what you know, translation of the Bible you're reading, if it's got pictures in it or if it's got more words than it needs to have in it. There are a lot. And it's basically one out of every six verses in the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke has something to say about material possessions. Nearly half of Jesus' parables are about possessions. Jesus spoke more about money and how to use it than he did about heaven and hell combined. 
then why is it that more people are more apt to talk about hell and where they want to send us in the first place rather than how we can make a difference in the world? See, all God desires for our lives includes our worship, our fellowship, our living after the likeness of Jesus to serve others and to be mission-minded of God around the world. So as we reflect on giving, we want to wrap our learning, our understanding around a theme that captures this season in which we are a part of when it captures God's gratitude within our lives. This gratitude takes into account two aspects of our response to God's grace in our lives. We call this thanks and giving. I'm reminded of this idea of thanks and giving from yesterday's visit to the Islamic Community Center in Tempe. I, I mentioned in our prayer that the phrase Allah Akbar means God is great. One of the questions that was expressed to the community was, in the Muslim tradition, do they experience things like communion or baptism, sacraments, those things that we consider holy? The response that we heard is basically all of life is sacred, all of life is sacrament, and begins at birth. Begins at birth when that child is held within the hands of a parent who whispers into that child's ear a prayer. A prayer that says, God is great. Glory be to you, O God. All praises are due to God, and blessed be God's name. You are majesty, and none is worthy of worship but you. Child's life begins life knowing that God is in the center of it all. And as a person comes to the conclusion of their earthly life, the community gathers once again around that body and says, and I would think the spirit of that person hears that very prayer they heard at birth, that God is great, that none is worthy of worship but God. Life is bookend by God, by worshiping God. Life is that very act of thanks and giving. God has blessed us in many different ways, and such generosity of God's grace is a prayer that is not only received, but a prayer that is given. This morning, I want to identify some characteristics of biblical generosity. These are characteristics that surface as expressions of our thanks and giving to God. They might be some familiar ideas or concepts that are familiar. They might be something that's brand new to you. But first of all, when it comes to a characteristic of biblical generosity, we want to understand that this is something that is about giving one's first and their best to God, not their least nor their, lot, their, their least or their last. You see, when it comes to biblical generosity, we might be familiar with a phrase called a tithe. A percentage or a portion of what our income is that we give back to God. Now those amongst us might say, well, isn't everything God's? Yes, it is. But we strive within our faith journey to try to give some sort of percentage of our income. It's a means of what we have received that we give back through service, through witness, through treating our neighbors as ourselves. It's making that intentional effort that I'm going to do this. Another characteristic of biblical generosity has to do, do with it being regular and systematic. It's a, a pattern. Now, your pattern might be weekly or it might be at the end of the year. But such giving is a rhythm, a rhythm of looking beyond ourselves for the sake and welfare of the needs of others. Another characteristic, a third characteristic of biblical generosity is something that is proportional to our income. We give based on how God has blessed us. But remember, you can't outgive God. Try it. I dare you. Remember, you won't sleep well at night. 
And then another aspect, maybe it's the fourth one of this uh, series of characteristics, is biblical generosity involves sacrifice. Giving is not convenient. But God doesn't want you to slaughter yourself financially. God wants you to live within your means and to live in a way that celebrates the sacrifice that you make to stay within your means so you don't get, go in over your head. And then finally, always remember that biblical generosity is thoughtful. It's something that's voluntary, but it's always bookend in worship. Giving is an act of worship. Giving is not your weekly, monthly, annual utility bill to the church. Nor is it the tip that we leave at the altar because eh, the service was all right. You see, these characteristics of biblical generosity are a reminder to us that everything comes from God. That we're called to be those managers of what God gives to us, those resources. That we're called to dedicate all that we have to God, and in doing so, God will bless you. And God will bless all that is provided for. Each week when we gather for prayer, we, we lift up the Lord's Prayer and we say that phrase, give us this day our daily bread. You see, that word bread denotes everything necessary that sustains life. It's sustenance. The petition implies our very no, uh, dependence upon God who supplies our needs. That as we're dependent upon God, we are dependent upon God each and every day. It's an intention that Jesus would say is something that is every day. But notice that it's a prayer that is plural. We pray, give us, not give me. Give us this day our daily bread. And it is evidently then therefore intended to be used by, by more than one person. It's a communal effort. It's what people say when they come together. It's a prayer that contains that strong command to be daily. We're called to turn to the one who provides all things in our lives, the source of what we eat, the air that we breathe. God is the source of our strength. And we should be thankful for this. It is the divine who's created the means of our stuff. One group that was depicted was the, the Macedonians that Paul reached out to, and this was a community of faith that often were not so much churched in the Jewish tradition. But the Macedonians were so excited about the message of the good news of, of Jesus Christ that Paul was talking about that they wanted to make a difference to the, the Jewish Christians in Jerusalem. They were interested in the rebuilding of the temple, the rebuilding of the community of faith, that they wanted to do what they were doing in their faith. It was almost like they were doing a monkey see, monkey do, believer do, believer see. They wanted to learn from the model that others were benefiting from, one that reached out from the heart to those who were in need. You see, the church at Macedonia was poor, but yet they found that they could be encouraged in such a way that they could extend themselves and give to others. In the collection of those people, within their work as a bunch of, of Gentiles, they indeed made a collection that brought forth a recognition of who they were indebted to. You see, we're not called to, to give financially, but we're to give of our very lives for the work of God. Why? Because all that we have from God is what God has given to us. Therefore, we allow God to claim in us what belongs to God, not just a slice of what might belong to God, but all belongs to God. And as we kind of fidget and wrestle within our seats and yeah but maybe not this or this 
Remember the air that you breathe and the air that you exhale is also that which God has given to us and that which we can be thankful. I want to provide you with an image. Maybe it's a little uh, tongue-in-cheek. But a glimpse at about how maybe we perceive what we have in our lives and where we place those priorities. I invite you to watch this video with me. Oh, I could. Well, maybe just a bite. You didn't hear the comment he said dude he brought the pie anybody want some pie what if God gave you a pie what would you do with it but God has brought you a pie we're called to do well with what God has given us God gives us the pie which represents our lives our resources our thankfulness our giving we too are asked to give back that pie to God. But first and foremost is to recognize that source of our daily bread, the one that feeds our physical stomachs, fills our garages, our closets, our homes, the lives of others, but mostly feeds our soul and calls us to be a part of that thanks, that giving, in which we are as the community of faith. May we begin thinking. May we begin living. May we begin giving. But most of all, just give thanks. Amen. <laughs>